defensive line show. They had great defense. They won on defense, special teams, offense, coaching. They won in every aspect of that game. Urban Meyer. Oh, oh, oh. This little blue stripe right there. And I always like the relics with the nice blue, with the nice stripe down them. Welcome back to episode two of the Michael Sports Hour podcast. Today we're going to be going over some of the top topics in sports, and those topics include going to the NFL to, to recap both conference championship games, which went to overtime and came down to some controversial calls from the referees towards the end of that game. I'll discuss my thoughts on those calls, plus some requests from you guys, such as the Cowboys' future for the 2019 season, plus my thoughts on Kyler Murray heading to the NFL draft possibly jeopardizing his MLB career if he decides to possibly go back there for that route. Plus some college basketball as we had upset Saturday, last Saturday. So a lot of things to cover in this episode of the Michael Sports Hour podcast. And we're going to jump right into it. We'll start with the NFL, the Chiefs taking on the Patriots at Arrowhead Stadium. Patriots ended up winning that game in overtime, 37-31. to And one thriller of a game which saw the Patriots begin the game on front. First drive was fantastic. They were moving down the field, taking a lot of time off the clock, about an eight-minute opening drive for the New England Patriots. So they had a lot going on for them at the beginning of the game. They went into halftime with a 14 nothing lead over the Kansas City Chiefs. As I mentioned, they had some... They had drives, which took a lot of time off the clock. Their defense was getting the Chiefs off the field quick with some quick three and outs to begin the game. We had a lot of things going in the Patriots' way that were going right. Second half, a completely different story. Both games these two teams played were a tale of two halves. Patriots in the first, Chiefs in the second. The second half just featured a lot of Patrick Mahomes, and it wasn't really that way in the third quarter. The third quarter was, again, defensive, plus the Patriots taking over mostly even though the Chiefs did score that one touchdown. But then the fourth quarter, there was a combined 38 points scored. <laughs> Excuse me there. A combined 38 points scored between the two teams, which sent us to overtime, which overtime, that's where the controversy comes in. That's what I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes, but we're going to get into the recap of this game. We've got... Tom Brady touches the ball first, converts on some long third down and tens to Julian Edelman the first couple of times, then connects to Robert Gronkowski. And then Rex Burkhead on a second down and goal from the one-yard line runs in the game-winning walk-off touchdown to send the New England Patriots to their third straight Super Bowl and their fourth in the last five years. So the Patriots, wow. They are um, a dynasty, of course, and nobody argues that, but... Man, they had a lot of things going right for them, plus the overtime call, the overtime rules, and that's the controversy that comes in. Not just that, a couple of calls that were towards the end of the game. The officiating, I feel like it was both ways not the best, but the one call that a lot of people are talking about is, from that game specifically, is the roughing the passer call on Tom Brady. The, Tom Brady got scraped across the face mask, like barely, if he even got touched in the helmet, and he at least he at least got his shoulder touched, but that's when he was throwing the pass, and that was a pass interference. I don't know how that was called a pass interference, but you know, that's just football. Roughing the passer, awful roughing the passer calls. That is exactly what everybody was complaining about going coming out of this game and most of the season, pretty much. You've got. A lot of roughing the passer calls that are awful. Two sacks by Clay Matthews that were just nice hits were roughing the passers. It made absolutely no sense. Some of these roughing the passer calls that happened this season, it was ridiculous all over the league. I can remember a couple of ones that were on T.J. Watt, which he uh, just ended up swiping the legs of Matt Ryan as soon as he threw the pass. Like, here he is, balls out, almost on his way, like a... Not about a millisecond after he threw the ball, T.J. Watt touches him, to swipes him with his leg, and that's somehow a pass interference. Like a lot of questionable calls were for Pat for Pat roughing the passer this year, and it was very questionable. A lot of people didn't want to mention that. They did want to mention they didn't like that the referees 
we're calling these roughing the passers. It was all over the place this year. You got some plays that aren't roughing the passer, but with the way it's gone this season, they should be called. You got these roughing the passers that are just awful roughing the passer calls. So the re- the officiating has been all over the place this year. A lot of missed calls, a lot of questionable calls that they made. It was very I don't want to call it ridiculous, but I want to I want to say it needs to be cleaned up on the NFL standpoint. If they want to have a reputable league, if they want to have good officials, if they don't want all these fans complaining about these awful calls from the referees, then clean up the officiating because it was all over the place. It was not the best, to say the least, this season. But, you know, we can't do anything about it now. The call is over, but there's going to be a lot of discussion from referee calls and officiating calls over the off season, and there's no doubt about that. A lot of people are calling for that. And, you know, things are just going to have to change here in the NFL if we want some clean officiating, some happy fans, and if Commissioner Roger Goodell actually wants to care about the NFL fan base that he has going on, he's going to need to clean up some officiating that has been going on because it has been all over the place. He was at the game. I don't know if he was questioning any of the calls, but, of course, he's the one. He's the head. He's making some of the main decisions. He needs to make some changes in the offseason, and that's my personal opinion. That's what's coming out of that game. But the overtime rule, that's the main thing I want to get into. It's, that's not anything to do with officiating. That's to do with rules and some rule changes that I think need to come in the offseason. Patrick Mahomes, maybe the best quarterback from this season, didn't touch the ball once in overtime. I hated that so much. I hate that rule so much. You have to win off a coin flip. You have to be lucky enough, whatever team is lucky enough in that game. If Patrick Mahomes got the ball first, we would be talking about Tom Brady. He needs to get the football. That's what we, that's what we would be talking about because only one team was going to touch that football in overtime. That was going to be it. Whichever team touched that football was going to go down the field and score. That's it. No more needs to be said. And the, there needs to be a change to the overtime. I believe what is more likely to happen if that is a rule change is you add a possession no matter what, even if it's a touchdown or a field goal by the team who gets the ball first. The other team has the chance to go down the field and score a touchdown to tie the game or score a touchdown to win the game or score a field goal to tie the game or score a field goal to win the game. No matter what, both teams need to have a possession in overtime. That's my personal opinion. I would like the NFL to go to high school and college rules where you start on the 25-yard line, each team goes down, you have the the ball at at the opposing 25 yard line. Each team gets a possession from there. And you go sudden death until the game is over. Starting with the third overtime, you have to go for two point conversions. I would love to see that in the NFL. I would like to see some rule changes in, when it comes to overtime in terms of that specifically because that is what needs to change in the NFL. That's another thing a lot of people are complaining about around, you know, journalists. I've been seeing it on TV a lot. Change the NFL rules. We need more over. We need Patrick Mahomes to touch the football. We all know that it would be that we'd be talking about something else. Tom Brady needs to touch the football if we're talking about the pay, the Chiefs winning that game. They're facing the Rams. Whatever the case was, we would be talking about that other team not getting the football with a chance to tie that game, and that is what needs to happen to change things here in the NFL overtime rules. Next to the NFC divisional round matchup, this is uh, not divisional round, championship game matchup, the Rams winning in overtime as well, 26 to 23 over the New Orleans Saints. Another questionable officiating call. Not rules, but officiating call completely. That is what we're seeing here and a lot of people are calling for some changes. But let's get into some of the game recaps here. The Rams down by 13 points early in the game. They couldn't get anything going offensively. They go into halftime down by, I believe it was 10, something of that nature. But they had a their largest deficit of the game was 13. They ended up coming back in the fourth quarter. Uh, Greg Zerline ended up making a 40-some yard field goal to tie the game. But that's not what everybody's talking about from the fourth quarter. They're talking about the pass interference c- no call. Yeah. You see the clip? And you would question that call. That call was one of the most ridiculous no calls in history. The Saints got completely cheated out of going to the Super Bowl, and I personally believe that. If the Saints score, if the Saints get that first down, they either have to kick a field goal with 14 seconds left. Rams have basically one miracle, one or two miracle plays to try to win the game, or you get a touchdown 
with around 30-some seconds left to go, and you force Jared Goff to drive down the field and get a touchdown instead of the, the Saints having to, settle for, having to settle for a field goal and giving the Rams the ball back with about, I believe it was just over a minute or just under a minute, and the Rams have an easy chance to go down and kick a field goal to tie the game. The game was tied 20-20 at that point. You have a chance to make it 27-20, to force the Rams to go down and score to tie the game to send this game to overtime. Or you can kick a field goal but only give the Rams about 14 seconds left. No, you have to kick a field goal with about 50-some seconds left. And now the Rams have an easy chance to go down and kick a field goal. Plus you have Greg Zerline, which is one of the best kickers in the NFL, most range that of really any kicker in the NFL. That Some of his kicks could be good from 65 yards easily. He is one of the longest range kickers in the NFL. He is It's definitely more than Adam Vinatieri. I believe it's more than Jake Elliott of Philadelphia, even though he's made a 63-yard field goal. I feel like Zerline can make a 65-yarder if you gave him that opportunity in a dome like New Orleans. Overtime, Saints, they get the ball first, so you think, okay, what we're talking about, I just talked about, you know, the Saints, of course, they're going to win, and we're going to be talking about overtime again. No, Drew Brees throws an interception. The defense coming up with a big play, and then the Rams kick a 57-yard field goal, which that field goal would have been good from 65 yards, which is why I believe Zerline can make a 65-yarder. And the Rams end up winning that game in overtime. Greg Zerline, again, one of the best kickers. You give him an opportunity from anywhere that's po- that's even the, sm- the slightest possibility to make it in New Orleans, in that dome stadium, He's going to make that field goal, and there's no doubt about that. So the call here that we're talking about is pass interference. What do you do to change this? Because there was a lot of pass interference, no calls. And the, the specific pass interference we're talking about, that wasn't just pass interference. That was, a, that was at least pass interference. There was definitely a helmet-to-helmet there. So you got two calls that you missed on the same play right in front of you, a blatant call that you can just throw the flag, and nobody would question it. The Rams defensive back even came out and said okay that was pass interference I'm surprised it wasn't called that was an awful no call from the officials and I am just furious I didn't want the Saints to win I would have preferred the Rams to win but I am furious that this is how bad NFL officiating is not as bad of a call in the Chiefs game that I don't think that affected the outcome of that game but this pass interference call definitely affected the outcome of this game. And NFL officiating has been so all over the place this year. This is a call. This is a no call. We're adding in so many rules that the penalties are going to change. So this is kind of like a developing year, but we can get the calls right. You didn't even come close to getting most of these calls right. If these NFL officiate, if these NFL officials are listening, nobody really came even close to getting any of these calls right, which is why I am furious. I feel like it should have been the Chiefs and the Saints in the Super Bowl. That's what I predicted, and we get the Patriots and the Rams, two teams who nobody thought they were going to win. And if you change the outcomes of some of those calls and some of those, everything that goes around, change the overtime rules, you make that pass interference call, no call, a call, you've got a different, you've got a completely different Super Bowl on your hands. Chiefs for a Super Bowl since Super Bowl four, Saints looking to get a second ring in the Sa- in the Sean Payton Drew Brees era. Instead, we're talking about Sean McVay, the youngest head coach to go to the Super Bowl in Super Bowl history. And the Belichick-Brady dynasty are looking to add a sixth ring to tie the Steelers for the most rings in Super Bowl history. I feel you have a tale of one Super Bowl, which everybody everybody wants this. Everybody wanted the Saints and Chiefs Super Bowl. That's one heck of a Super Bowl. But you've got the Rams and Patriots, which some people would have liked, but nobody wanted the Patriots in the Super Bowl. And I'm not saying this is bad for the. I'm I am saying this is bad for the NFL, but. You know, you've got to have a change at some point to some of these rules, some of these calls. There is, some people are calling for the game to actually be replayed. I don't think it needs to go that far, but I think that there's got to be something that goes on with no calls and being able to challenge no calls or calls, penalties. I think that at least pass interference needs to be added to the list of things that can be challenged in the NFL. That is my personal opinion. Because pass interference, along with roughing the passer, I believe those two calls are the most missed calls, whether it's a call that's bad or it's a no call, which should be blatantly called. Both teams know it. So that is my personal opinion on all this. Leave yours in the comments down below. And also, while I'm thinking about it, 
why don't you leave some things you want me to talk about in the next video down below some of those comments down below if you want me to talk about certain things in a certain sport and you're not hearing about it anywhere else I'll talk about it gladly and give you my thoughts and opinions on things like those and some different angles possibly that you might think but make sure to leave those in the comments below about different topics you want me to talk about in episode three of the sports hour podcast i don't know when that will be released but details about that will be coming in the next youtube videos shortly but that's it for the nfl championship rounds leave your thoughts about those in the comments below and i think i i know i went off on the nfl officials but i think that that has been coming from a long for a long time from me at least so, media Super Bowl preview. This will go on for about three minutes. Let's talk about the Rams and the Patriots. Super Bowl has happened before. The Patriots won that one. So the Rams get some ch a chance to redeem themselves. That was when they were the St. Louis Rams. I believe it was Super Bowl 33. So a rematch of that Super Bowl. So we'll see who wins that Super Bowl. I have the first opinion, of course, you're going to pick the Patriots. It's a dynasty. But you, you're going to look into the numbers, and you're going to believe, oh, really, wow. Uh, didn't know that about the Rams because they have one of the better defenses in the NFL, if you think about it. They've got a great front seven that includes Aaron Donald and Adamican Sue. Donald can very well be one of the NFL players of the year. And if you watch him play football, he is so dynamic. He is so fast bursting out of the line of scrimmage. He can break, tackle, he can break a block in about not even two seconds. He can break right into the backfield because that's about the time you want to be getting rid of the football if you're a quarterback. About two, two and a half seconds. Donald can break a block in about one, one and a half seconds. It's very, very, very quick. And Donald is one of those guys you almost can't block. Donald is a fantastic guard who is... I don't. I, you can call him unblockable, and nobody would disagree because he is one of the. He might be unblockable because he is just. It. I feel like that he's gonna get to Tom Brady. I don't care what stats you're gonna tell me about. Oh wow, Tom Brady wasn't sacked one time against the Chargers. You cannot tell me the Chargers have a, as dynamic of a defense as the Los Angeles Rams. Oh, he wasn't sacked the entire game against the Kansas City Chiefs. Okay, I can believe that stat and still think because the Chiefs don't have as dynamic of a defense, in my opinion, or as dynamic by dynamic of a front seven as the Los Angeles Rams. So the Patriots, they're going to have to face a front seven that is unlike any other that they have had to contain this postseason. Last time they can they had to face a front seven like this, I believe it was the Pittsburgh Steelers, and they were only held to ten points. Lost that game seventeen to ten. So really when the if you look back at it, the Patriots, their tests not that were not at home against dynamic front sevens, they really haven't been able to put up good offensive numbers. So it's gonna be interesting to see the battle between the Patriots offensive line and the Rams front seven because that is one heck of a battle that everybody's going to want to see and everybody's going to want to learn about. And you're going to look at the stats and you're going to think, and it's not really the main thing everybody's looking about. Everybody's looking about McVay versus Belichick, the master versus the student, Goff, one of the youngest quarterbacks, fastest quarterback to reach the NFL Super Bowl since the 1970 merger. Only took him three seasons. And then you have Tom Brady... Everybody's, and a lot of people call him the greatest quarterback of all time, so it's going to be interesting to see the student versus the master. That's what everybody's talking about. But one of the more underrated storylines that's really going to come into factor, that's going to come into play in this Super Bowl, is going to be the Rams front seven versus the Patriots offensive line. I feel like the Rams are going to win that battle, and it's going to give Tom Brady a heck of a lot of trouble in the backfield. And really, Tom Brady, this season, he hasn't been able to deal with trouble in the backfield all that, mu all that well. That is why he has had one of the his statist, statistically one of the worst seasons in his career in in the last few years. I believe this was one of his. I, th I believe it was his statistically worst season since 2009. I believe. So a lot of things can go the Rams' way when the Rams' defense steps on the field. I believe that that's where the game is going to be won. Patriots offense and Rams defense. Who's going to win that battle? It's going to be back and forth. If you look at it first and you see that Rams front seven, if you look in it farther you're like, you, and you look at those names and you look at their performances throughout the season, you start to wonder, does this Patriots offensive line have enough firepower to handle that? 
because the Rams, in my opinion, are one of the more underrated defense. Yeah, they gave up 51 points to the Kansas City Chiefs, but I don't care. They shut down the Saints, who they who scored 45 points on them last time, and they shut them down, hold them to 23. Yes, you have that pass interference call, which I just went on a rant about. But still, even if you only give up 27 points, that's one heck of a performance, one heck of a upgrade. I can't find the word for it right now, but it's a lot better of a performance from the last time. So the Rams' defense has improved significantly from regular season to postseason. So that's going to be the most interesting matchup to see, in my opinion. Plus the Rams holding the Cowboys to 22 points, one of the more dynamic offenses towards the end of the season. I think that's going to be one of the more important matchups to watch and one of the more underrated matchups that everybody's overlooking right now. In the immediate Super Bowl preview, that's my immediate Super Bowl preview, and now one of your guys' requests. Talk about the Cowboys' future and how they will bounce back from the 2018 season. So let's get into that, Cowboys. Let's recap their 2018 season, first of all. It started off very slow. A lot of people thought, okay, it's going to be another NFC East division crown going to the Philadelphia Eagles. Nobody looked like they could be able to contend in that NFC East, and then Cowboys midseason, they start going on a little bit of a run, and then towards the end of the season, they had even better performances. They had a nice overtime win against the Philadelphia Eagles. They had a fantastic win, 13-10 to over the Saints at home. <coughs> Excuse me. Right there, and they had some quality wins towards the end of the season, which was very impressive. I thought the Cowboys could have a chance to go some way in the NFL playoffs, but we all know how that went. It came to a screeching halt against the Los Angeles Rams. So that's a quick recap for the Cowboys' 2018 season. Now on to 2019 for the Dallas Cowboys. First glance and everything you want to talk about, the last time they had a season about this good, their bounce-back season wasn't the best. They had a season this good, lost to the Green Bay Packers in the playoffs, did not have a very good bounce-back season. So if you want to use that, I'm not going to use that selling point. You're not going to be able to sell me on that because the Cowboys have one of the more dynamic offenses in the NFC. That's why they got the four seed. That's why they won the NFC East by a large margin over the Philadelphia Eagles and the Washington Redskins, who did surprisingly good to start the season. But that all came crashing down. Alex Smith went down to an injury, and they eventually had to go with Colt McCoy on Thanksgiving. So that's what it came to for the Washington Redskins, but the Redskins, once they get Alex Smith back next season, they can be a real contender in the NFC East. So the Cowboys, I think that if you're going into next season, I don't want to. I I wouldn't watch for the Philadelphia Eagles until they become a real threat. I would really watch for the Washington Redskins because if they can keep Alex Smith healthy for an entire season, I see the Redskins being a real threat to taking down the Cowboys, who were the defending NFC East champions. But 2019, it looks bright for the Cowboys. Dak Prescott, he's a good quarterback for the Cowboys. He has been good for the fans down in Dallas, for America's team for the last couple of years. I, in my opinion, though, for Cowboys fans watching, you might not want to hear this, but I really think that Dak Prescott is not Super Bowl ready. I don't think he has the potential to be a Super Bowl quarterback just yet. He has the weapons, though. Amari Cooper, a wide receiver. He's got weapons all over the place in Dallas. Amari Cooper, the leading receiver. So Dak Prescott, a lot of weapons. Plus, you have running back Ezekiel Elliott. Oh, Ezekiel Elliott is just so good. Such a fantastic running back. One of the best, maybe even the best. I don't think he's better than Todd Gurley, though. One of the best running backs in the NFC. But the Cowboys, you you got to look at some of these top teams. They've got two-headed monsters at running back. Saints, they have Alvin Kamara and and Mark Ingram. The Rams, they have Todd Gurley and C.J. Anderson, a one-two punch there. A lot of these teams that have made it places have a one-two punch. Patriots, Sony Michelle and Rex Burkhead. Uh, Chiefs, they have Spencer Ware and Williams. So the... Team, every team that made it into the championship round had a one-two punch at running back, so I think that's what you got to be thinking of if you're the Cowboys. Around the third, fourth round pick, fourth round pick for the Cowboys, I would try to find a second running back so Zeke can go with a, 
so Zeke can have a one-two punch at running back because with the way the Cowboys run the ball, Zeke gets a little fatigued, and that's why he doesn't perform well towards the end of games. He got shut down by the Rams. If the Cowboys had a one-two punch, I believe they would have made it to the championship round, but that's the one thing I think the Cowboys need going into the 2019 season, a one-two punch at running back. That's what I believe is going to be needed out of the Dallas Cowboys if they want to win in 2019. Defensive-wise, they are missing a couple pieces on the front seven. That's all. Sean Lee, when he's in, I think he's an okay linebacker. Leighton Van Der Esch, I thought he was going to be going to the Steelers. He ended up going to the Dallas Cowboys, and boy, what a linebacker he was. One of the best linebackers in the NFC last season. He was a clear front seven leader for Dallas. So I think that their main needs in the draft are going to be defensive linemen. I think in free agency, you go after maybe one more linebacker, an outside linebacker, helping Leighton Van Der Esch out there in that position. But your main need is going to be signing one maybe or drafting a couple of defensive linemen. That's your main weakness if you're the Dallas Cowboys. Just sign a couple of those. Um, you have a half-decent secondary. I think that's your... I think if you're the Cowboys, you got to go first-round pick, definitely a defensive lineman. That's your main need to start off the draft. Second pick, I think you're going to have to go with, I think you go with a, a cornerback, somebody in the defensive line. Third round, you go back to defensive lineman. Fourth round, find that one-two punch at running back. And then fifth, sixth, and seventh, knock yourself out. I don't care where you go. But I think you mainly have to look at defensive linemen and secondary players for the Cowboys. That's your main weakness on defense. Back secondary players such as safeties, you have uh, you have good defensive back depth, but I think you have to go back towards the safeties and defensive linemen if you're the Dallas Cowboys, if you want to make us uh, um, some big improvements in 2019. Already firing the offensive coordinator in Scotland a hand. I don't know who you're who the Cowboys are going to hire. I'm not going to make any guesses because I don't know what the Cowboys are looking at. It depends on what offense they're going to try to run. I don't know what Jason Garrett's going to want to run. I don't know what Jerry Jones is going to want to find. So I'm not going to make any guesses on that. But once I find, but once we start getting into a look into the names that you're looking in and trying to find out what the styles of Prescott and Elliott are. You can make some guesses. I don't think you can make any right now, but Cowboys, they're making some improvements. They're starting off well. I just think they have to make the right choices in the offseason and draft, drafting the right positions and guys to make some severe improvements in 2019. It's all going to come down to the draft, but I think that if they draft the right guys, if they draft some defensive linemen, some safeties, improve their secondary and defensive line, I think that, that next year they could be a real threat. And I don't know if the rookies can make a huge impact in Season 1, but in Season 2, I believe in 2020, if the Cowboys can draft those right guys, they can be a real threat to deal with in the NFL, possibly winning another um, Super Bowl, adding to their collection of five Super Bowls already. So watch out for the Dallas Cowboys because they could be dangerous, but they could also fall and fault and become one of the cellar dwellers in the NFC East. It all comes down to if they choose the right guys to surround themselves with. That's it for the preview for the Cowboys season. Thank you for that request from the comment section. Next we have a comment request from Noah Boyer. Talk about Kyler Murray going to the NFL draft. Okay. I need to get so I need to get this off my chest. Kyler Murray, I know you're not watching. But I would, I would like to have a discussion with you, honestly. You are such a good baseball player. You have such a good future in front of you in baseball. Doesn't matter about height in baseball. You've got Jose Altuve. He's about my height, 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, just, it's just a little taller than I am. So small size doesn't matter in baseball. Oh, it matters in football. When you're looking at these guys who are 6'5", 6'6", 300-pound offensive linemen, and you're a little 5'10", 195 squatty quarterback, you're barely going to be able to see over these guys. In the first place, if you really, if you really think about it, you've got a guy who's right here, right here, just staying in front of the camera here, and then you've got these guys, and then you've got guys who are... 6'5", 6'6", 300-pound offensive lineman against a 5'10", 195-pound quarterback. You've already got your guaranteed money in baseball. I don't know why you're taking the risk in the NFL. It's your decision, but my personal opinion, I don't like this decision. You've got this money in baseball. You've already been guaranteed by the Oakland Athletics. 
They've already guaranteed you $4.6 million in a signing bonus. They've already given that to you. You've got a good contract with the Oakland Athletics. I believe it's very quick you're making it through that farm system. I think that next year in 2020, Kyler Murray, if he, if he decided to stay with baseball or decides to stay with baseball, I believe Kyler Murray could easily make, make it to the MLB in the 2020 season. I don't know if that's, open, if that's by opening day or midseason, but Kyler Murray has such a sure future in the MLB. He's already got that contract. He's already got the money. He's already got the trust of the Oakland Athletics organization. He's already going to make it in the MLB, and we all know that. I don't know why he's taking the risk of football. Plus, you can't double down on sports like you might be thinking you can do. Not going to be an easy thing to do if you're Kyler Murray. Because the quarterback, that's the main position. That is the team leader. Kyler Murray is a great baseball player, center fielder, but you can't just be like Bo Jackson or Deion Sanders, show up after the MLB season is over. Hope you don't make the playoffs because if you make the playoffs, you're not going to be back before the first game. Heck, you're not going to be back for the first game if you're going to play in the MLB. If you're playing MLB, you're not making the postseason, and that is for sure. Even you, your team might make the postseason, you're not going to be able to play, especially if you're a quarterback. You need to be there for camp. You need to be there for mini camp. You need to be there for every off-season activity because you're this team leader. You need to be there every day working hard with everybody else on that team because you need to earn their trust because that's the main position. You're going to be the main person, main player on that field. You need to make a good interpretation of your team. You can't just be off in baseball show up mid-August and be like, okay, I'm here. You've already gone through mini camps and everything like that. You can't just show up maybe in the middle of August if you want to take off the baseball season towards the end of September, beginning of October. You can't just show up and be like, okay, guys, I'm here. Let's, let's get to work. You guys have, your guys have already gone to work, and now you're just showing up. That's not going to work. You've got the surefire money in baseball. Why take the risk in the NFL, which is clearly a more physical sport, where size matters a lot. It's just a dumb decision, in my opinion, by Kyler Murray. I, I would have said, stay with baseball. You've got the money already. You've already gotten $4.6 million from playing baseball and being drafted by the Athletics. You really need to stick with the sport that has brought you in and giving you your, your surefire profession. Not take a risk in the NFL where you could be a, the first quarterback taken. You could be a late second-round pick and not get really that much money, and you're throwing away $4.6 million. Here's, here's $4.6 million. Bye-bye. I'm going to go play the NFL, get $555,000. And get the heck and get the heck beaten out of me, but it's okay, cause I threw away 4.6 million dollars in baseball. Stay with the Athletics and get your guaranteed money, earn your guaranteed money, and play a less physical sport. If you like physical sports, okay, go play, go play football. Just throw away 4.6 million dollars. Take the money. I know you love football, but you also love baseball. That's why you play. That's why you play it. That's why you got drafted. So, I don't know what to say other than I am in complete shock that he chose the NFL. And I think it's the wrong decision, period. Take your money, don't risk it, and don't risk your body in football. Leave the NFL, go play in the MLB where you already guaranteed your money in a place where I believe you could be playing professional in 2020 and starting for the athletics in center field and not just go to the NFL where you're hoping you're a starting quarterback as a rookie, and then you have some sort of career-ending injury and risk it. I know you can risk it in the MLB, but you've already got your guaranteed money. Don't risk it in the NFL where you're going to have a small money contract to start out, of course, because it's your rookie contract, and then you have a career-altering injury. You can't go back to baseball. You're going to be hurting football because you don't want to go back and play it and then everything just goes downhill. Take the road where it's already still going up and it won't stop going up. I say stay with baseball, but man, do whatever floats your boat. 
All right. All right, let's uh, continue on with this episode of the Michael Sports Hour podcast. Let's go with another topic in the MLB just announced not too long ago. The 2019 MLB Hall of Fame class, they will be inducted in 2019. Excuse me there for a second. Um, the first unanimous Hall of Famer, the first ever time a ballot member has been voted into the Hall of Fame unanimously, is in the 2019 class. Take a guess who? It's Mariano Rivera, the last ever person to wear the number 42 in Major League Baseball, wearing the pinstripes this entire season, playing for the dynasty that is the New York Yankees, winning some more winning a few World Series with them, playing for such a great dynasty. <coughs> winning, I believe it was the 2009 World Series with New York over the Philadelphia Phillies. That's the most recent and the last World Series he won. He had such a dynamic career in the MLB. It's no doubt that he was getting in in his first, uh, he was getting in in his first year of eligibility. But unanimous. That kind of shocked me. I believe, I, I would have thought there was going to be a couple of people out there that are going to be skeptical, like, uh, I don't know about this guy. He can be a little skeptical. No, he definitely was a Hall of Famer and the first unanimous guy, and I think he, he deserved it to be the first unanimous player to be voted into the, two, to the MLB Hall of Fame, and he's going to be inducted in August of the 2019 class. He will be joined by Roy Halladay, who unfortunately passed away just last year in a, an airplane accident. We're going to need to become a pilot. So that was that's very that was very unfortunate. I was actually shocked when I found out that news. But you know, rest in peace, Roy Holiday. But you will always be remembered and enshrined in the MLB Hall of Fame. You will be joined by Edgar Martinez and Mike Mussini, Mussina, as the members to go into the Hall of Fame. But Mariano Rivera, being the first unanimous player voted into the MLB Hall of Fame, is it a shock to you guys? Are you guys? Surprised? Are you a Yankees fan and you're jumping out of your seats, jumping for joy, or is this expectation for you? Because right now, I think that he deserved it, but it kind of came as a shock to me. Leave your thoughts in the comments down below about Mariano Rivera being the first unanimous pl player to be unanimously selected to the a Hall of Fame. He will be enshrined in August of this year in the MLB Hall of Fame. That's it for our MLB segment here on the Michael Sports Hour podcast. Moving on to college basketball, we had a couple. We had a crazy Saturday that we're gonna try to recap in this. It was just about 20 minutes left to go in this podcast. Plus, we have some college football transfers to go over and some NBA updates. All right, college basketball. Let's start with them. Let's start with the one versus four matchup, which now I believe it's a two versus three in the seating right now. Duke, 72 of Virginia, 70 of Virginia, had such a dominant run last year and such a dominant run this year. They were undefeated going into this game. One of two un remaining unbeatens going into the day. We left with zero remaining unbeatens in that Saturday. Both teams losing on the road. We'll go over the other in a second. But Virginia, that was only their second loss in ACC play over the last two seasons. Only one loss last year. Only one loss so far this year. So Virginia is playing fantastic basketball in the ACC, but I think that UMBC loss is behind them. Everybody knows what happened there. First 16 seed to beat a one. But I think that's behind them. I think that they can make a far run in the tournament if they can keep playing like this. Ended up having a dominant win over Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech had such a good defense, and then they end up letting Virginia score 80, 80 points. So Virginia has had some dominant performances over some of the top teams in college basketball who Virginia Tech put up 100 on North Carolina, beating them 100-82 to just a couple of nights ago. So Virginia has had a great season. Duke, up and down season, they had a 34-point win over Kentucky, who is ranked number 8 now, I believe. Yeah, number 8. And... Then they had the loss to number three, Gonzaga, the loss to unranked Syracuse. There are two losses on the season. Now they have this big win over Virginia by two points. So Duke has had an up-and-down season. You never know what they're going to do, and that's Duke basketball for you right there. They won the national championship in 2015. Just a couple of years before that, losing to Lehigh in the first round, 15 beating a two, and then a 14 beats a three next year. It was Mercer beating Duke, and then... In 2017, South Carolina knocks out Duke in the second round. 
who I had Duke winning the national title that year. So it has been a Duke basketball is up and down. You don't know what you're going to get from them. They have been down. They haven't had the best performances in the tournament, but I think that if this year they can play like they did against Virginia, they can make it some. They can make it a far away in the tournament. It just depends on how Duke plays. If they play their best, they're a team that can knock a lot of powerhouses out. If they play. If they don't play their best, if they're off their game just a little bit, they're a team that can be beaten by Syracuse and nearly be beaten by Florida State. So Duke basketball, they've been up and down this season, but Duke, again, mentioning the loss to Syracuse, their second loss of the season, 14-2 on this, on this year, losing that one spot for the second time this season. That is, let's count this down, Villanova lost as a one seed early in the season. Duke lost as a one seed early in the season. Duke lost as a one seed again to Syracuse. Gonzaga lost as a one seed. Kansas lost as a one seed. That is five losses by one seeds this season alone. And that was insane. And we all thought and we all think, okay, you know, who's next in line for number one? Is it going to be Michigan, who's undefeated, had some great performances, beat Villanova, the reigning national champions, by by 27 points, beating North Carolina, a dynasty, as always. Such a great coach in Roy Williams. They're always great, beating North Carolina by 17, but then they end up going to Wisconsin. Anything can happen in conference play, pretty much. 64-54, to 54, Wisconsin beats the second seed of Michigan Wolverines. I believe they fell down to number four after that loss. So Michigan ending up with their first loss on the season as well as Virginia. So they're both in the loss column this season. Michigan, they just didn't play their best basketball in that game. I was kind of rooting for Wisconsin because, you know, as an Ohio State fan, of course, if you see here, go Bucks. Um, you know, as an Ohio State fan, I always root against Michigan. And Wisconsin got the job done against the, Wolver against the Wolverines at home. So Michigan losing their first game. This is big, a shakeup in college basketball. Who's going to be next in line for number one? Is it going to be Tennessee finally getting their shine at number one? Is it going to be Kansas? It's not going to be Kansas. They lost it on road at West Virginia. When West Virginia is 1-5 and five now in conference play, their first win. West Virginia has had a surprisingly down season so far. So West Virginia, not the most amusing of teams so far. So that's that. We've got... Texas Tech, who they could be in line to go for number two, maybe, number three, or maybe number four. Texas Tech loses on the road to Baylor. So the Big 12 has been everywhere this year. Ups and downs, side to side. You never know what you're going to get out of the Big 12. I believe that this is the year Kansas is not going to win the Big 12 tournament, but that's, not, that's a topic for a different episode. We're talking about who's going to get number one. Tennessee gets number one. They finally get their shot at number one, and I feel like that they have played some of their best basketball that they have played in a while. Only the second time in school history they have reached the AP number one spot, and their head coach is the sixth head coach now to become – their sixth head – is the sixth head coach to be – to hold an AP number one spot with multiple different programs. So Tennessee, they have a good head coach. They have a great roster. So Tennessee, I believe that they can make a deep run in the tournament this year. If they can keep playing like this, Tennessee is clearly, if they keep playing like this, again, they're going to win the SEC. Kentucky might be able to win the SEC, but Tennessee, they have been playing some of the best basketball Tennessee basketball has ever played. So they are a possible national championship team. So don't sleep on the volunteers in this season of basketball we always sleep on them in football don't sleep on them basketball now because now they are one dominant program in the college basketball world that's it for college basketball now into some college football transfers that i know they happened last week but you know we got to talk about them because they're big five quarterbacks transferring schools excuse me four quarterbacks transferring schools but five transfer decisions here that we're going to talk about, and we'll talk about them down the order. I have them in my paper first. Jalen Hurts transferring to Oklahoma. Oklahoma gets another quarterback to succeed. Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray, who were walk-ons to begin, walk-ons at their old school, transferred to Oklahoma, and now they are Heisman winners. Back-to-back -back Oklahoma quarterbacks winning the Heisman Trophy. Can Jalen Hurts keep that legacy at the Oklahoma Sooners? How will he be able to adapt to the Big 12 in Oklahoma's style of play, more offensive, more passing, 
SEC, it wasn't as offensive. You had that element of defense, but now Jalen Hurts, he can be favorable, favorable in that offensive style of play that the Big 12 has. So it depends on how it goes for Jalen Hurts. It depends on how things work out in that sort of nature, but Jalen Hurts, I feel like he's going to be able to adapt easily to this style of play that Oklahoma has. Um, you know, Oklahoma, it's an offensive team down there. It's all about the quarterback. You got to keep the quarterback healthy. You got to keep the quarterback at their top. But, of course, Jalen Hurts, he's a rushing quarterback. And Baker Mayfield was a passing quarterback. Then you go to Kyler Murray, who's a good passing quarterback. But he also has that mobility to run, to move around the pocket. I feel like Jalen Hurts is more of a mobile quarterback, more of a rushing quarterback. So we'll see how he adapts to Lincoln Riley's style of play. It's going to be interesting to see how he does in the Big 12. But he takes a spot that Austin Kendall was supposed to take. So Austin Kendall, what is he going to do? Is he going to sit on the bench again? Is he going to have to play his senior year and that's it? No. Austin Kendall is going to transfer to WVU, and he is going to be able to have an eligibility in his first year Oklahoma, allowing the transfer. Austin Kendall staying in the Big 12. He's been familiar with the Big 12 the past few years. So staying in Oklahoma, he's now moving to West Virginia, one of Oklahoma's big rival schools aside from Oklahoma State. So... WVU, they've been needing a quarterback. A lot of people thought they were going to get Tate Martell as their quarterback. Martell transferring to a different school. We'll go over that in just a few minutes. But Austin Kendall moves, goes to West Virginia, stays in the Big 12, so he knows how that style of play works. He knows that it's more offense than defense. So he goes into a team who doesn't have Dana Holgerson at head coach, doesn't have David Sills as a leading wide receiver, so they have lost a couple of key guys. Austin Kendall is one of the guys you need to help some recruiting classes go. The Troy head coach moving to West Virginia to take over that job. So a lot of movement around the West Virginia side of things, moving player, losing players, gaining players, gaining coaches. So it's been a lot of offseason talk and movement for the West Virginia Mountaineers, and they finally get a quarterback to succeed Will Greer. Their last quarterback that had to play in the bowl game did not very well and that's giving him a few comp that's giving him some compliments that's you know sugarcoating it a little bit so you know West Virginia they need a quarterback and they finally get a quarterback that can really succeed Will Greer he can do a very good job he's one of the top quarterback recruits in his class so it's going to be Interesting to see how he does at West Virginia. It's going to be interesting to see how West Virginia does with a new quarterback and to see how Will Greer is able to, not Will Greer, how Austin Kendall is going to be able to bring, try to bring West Virginia back from, you know, Will Greer down and now see if they can spring back up to a dynamic offense to a big dynamic offense that can that is a force to be reckoned with in the Big 12 that can mo- possibly take down Oklahoma this year and maybe win the pa- Big 12 but you got Texas to handle with who I believe is one of the t- is the team to be in the Big 12 this year. So, what about that Tate Martell news? He thought we was going to West Virginia. He visited WVU. He transfers to Miami, the school a lot of people Jalen thought Jalen Hurts was going to transfer to. So Tate Martell goes to Miami, the top dual threat quarterback in his cl- in his recruiting class. So that's a plus for the Miami Hurricanes. Manny Diaz, the new head coach there, he's trying to do an offensive makeover for Miami. He invented the turnover change, the, the chain, the defensive coordinator there. He was originally going to go to Temple and be the head coach for the Owls. And he decides to stay in Miami with Mark Richt deciding to retire. Danny Diaz takes that job, and Diaz has done a good job so far with recruiting and being able to get some guys to transfer to his school to get a quarterback and get that offensive makeover kind of not finished, but it's pretty close to a very good product. He's, he's going to put out a good offensive product on the field this year, losing a couple of quarterbacks that were dynamic that were very good for Miami. So we'll see how that goes. And also, good news for the Miami Hurricanes. Jeff Thomas decides to stay at the U, wide receiver. So Martell 
able to get a dynamic wide receiver, a leading wide receiver in that core that he can deal with. Martel, you know, he transfers, and before he transferred, he said, I'm not transferring. I'm staying here. I put too much work. I put too much blood, sweat, and tears into this program. I am not going to back up Justin Fields if he transfers here and Haskins goes to the draft. Justin Fields decides to transfer and Tate Martell pretty much takes back everything what he said because he decides to transfer. He goes to Miami and now he's going to be the leading quarterback of the Hurricanes offensive makeover. So the Hurricanes, can Manny Diaz get this Hurricanes team to contend in the ACC this season? Tate Martell, a dynamic quarterback. Jeff Thomas, he can lead the wide receivers into battle. So a dual threat quarterback and a nice wide receiving core. Miami, they might be able to contend with LSU, not LSU, Clemson this year. No, they can't contend with Clemson, but they can make a good run. <laughs> they can represent the ACC in the New Year's Six Bowl because I feel like that that's what Manny Diaz is going to push for this year. I really don't think he could push for an ACC title in your first year. With a couple of transfers, is Jeff Thomas staying? But you got Tate Martell, a transfer quarterback. You got a one first-year head coach. I feel like that Miami can attempt, but they're not going to be able to contend with Clemson. But in 2020, I can see Miami being a team that has a slim chance to take down Trevor Lawrence and the Clemson Tigers. Big transfer, big news for the Miami Hurricanes in their offensive makeover over at the U. Next, we go on to UCF. Brandon Wimbush, a big gain for the UCF Golden Knights. Brandon Wimbush decides to go to the UCF Golden Knights, and you can talk about Mackenzie Milton. That traumatic leg injury that he had suffering against USF, and you talk about if he's ever going to be back playing football. A lot of people are hopeful that he can play this year. I don't think it's going to be able to happen. That leg injury is already undergoing six surgeries for it. And then you have Ward, Daryl Ward as your quarterback. I really don't have the utmost faith in him. But you get Brandon Wimbush to transfer. He's a quarterback who can succeed Mackenzie Milton in a big time environment. Mackenzie Milton has had so many big time environment moments that he has succeeded in. He has had Cincinnati College Game Day. The lights are on finally on UCF and they shine against Cincinnati. The the I believe it was the Peach Bowl game against the Auburn Tigers. Lights are on them. Nobody can think they can do it. Well, they did it all right. 34 to 31 was that final score. And now you move on to Daryl Ward, who he has to succeed Mackenzie Milton in that big-time environment. The lights are on. Can UCF extend their one streak to 25 games? <coughs> they weren't able to. LSU takes them down, and that one streak just comes to a screeching halt because they didn't have a quarterback. Now they have Brandon Wimbush, who can succeed them in that big-time environment. Former Notre Dame quarterback started the season out as a starting Notre Dame quarterback, but Ian Book ended up taking over that job, as we all know. And Wimbush, he now transfer, enters the transfer portal, goes to UCF. And that's a big quarterback, big gain for the Golden Knights if they want to try to get something going there. And if they want to get back to their big time, we've got this under control. We can do this. We are... We are the best group of five team. I feel like UCF, if they want to get some consideration for the college football playoff, they got this quarterback, they just need to enter a big power, a big conference. A lot of quarterback transfers that we just went over. We'll go back over them again. Jalen Hurts transferring to Oklahoma, giving Oklahoma a big quarterback to succeed. Bray, Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray, that legacy there. Austin Kendall to WVU, able to give WVU a big quarter, uh, quarterback that they really need in the backfield. Tate Martell to Miami, also able to keep Jeff Thomas at wide receiver for the Hurricanes in the offensive makeover at the U. And Brandon Wimbush to UCF, a quarterback that can succeed. Mackenzie Milton in the big-time environment in the bright lights that are on the UCF Golden Knights. Now on to our last topic, the NBA, our last sports. Let's begin in Los 
Angeles. LeBron James missing a win versus Oklahoma City and a loss in overtime versus the Rockets, that groin injury. Participated fully in some practices. Missed the loss to the Golden State Warriors last night, but they're hopeful he can come back soon. Still no timetable for his return. We keep getting the same report week after week after week since December 25th. LeBron's going to miss a couple, of, a couple of more games. They're hopeful he can return for the next game. LeBron's going to miss a couple of more games. They're hopefully return for the next game. I believe we got in that report four or five times now. It's getting sick and tired. They know when he's coming back. They just refuse to tell us. LeBron's participating fully in practice. Just tell us when he's going to come back. Because we all know LeBron can come back any time now. And I, I think Lakers fans are going to start getting fed up with it. And, you know, a lot of people are going to get fed up with it. If we're being honest here. So, the Lakers just waiting on a timetable for LeBron's return. See when he'll come back to the Los Angeles Lakers and possibly make a big impact as they have, uh, I believe their record is 5-10 without LeBron in L.A. So they're going to need him desperately and they're going to enjoy him when he comes back in Los Angeles. Golden State Warriors, are they back to their history-making form slash championship slash dynasty whatever you want to call it we'll talk about some of their future di- we'll talk about some of their players futures in the second but Clay Thomas Thompson had a great game lot had a great game just a couple of nights ago 22 44 points I believe he made 10 straight three pointers so and I believe that was the start of the game. So Clay Thompson, he's on right now. Steph Curry, he's doing pretty good. I believe I've heard. And Draymond Green, Kevin Durant, they're not kind of the sideshow, but they haven't been the biggest contributors to the Warriors' late run. And you talk about the futures. Draymond Green has a player option for next year. Still has one year on his contract after this year. Steph Curry with three years on his contract. He's not going anywhere. Unrestricted free agent is Kevin Durant and Clay Thompson. So a couple of guys that could leave, three guys that could leave. So could this be the last year of the Warriors dynasty? Or will it just all be a ruse? Everybody's going to answer that question. If you want to answer that question and tell me your thoughts, leave them in the comments below. But I think that for Clay Thompson, he's going to stay. I think that he's going to be able to stay with the Warriors. He's going to want to win a couple more championships as a dynasty. But you talk about Kevin Durant. I believe at least one of those guys will stay. One of those guys will leave most likely for the Los Angeles Lakers and New York Knicks. I feel like it would be Kevin Durant. He won his championship that he wanted with the Warriors. Now he's going to deserve, want and deserve his big paycheck that he wants. And I think he's going to get it either in the Lakers or the New York Knicks. So somewhere that Kevin Durant's going, he's going to get his paycheck and he's going to get some a big time environment possibly won a championship with that team but I think that the Warriors dynasty is going to lose a big player Clay Thompson I don't think he's going to want his big paycheck he's going to get somewhat of a big paycheck when he st- if he stays with the Warriors which I believe he will so I think Kevin Durant he's moving on to get a big paycheck now that he won a couple of titles possibly three if he can win this one this year I think Clay Thompson is going to stay he just has the big chemistry it's going to go back to the big three that it was before Kevin Durant arrived of Kevin of Stephen Curry, Clay Thompson, and Draymond Green. That's what I believe is going to happen to the Warriors dynasty. Last talk about the NBA. We'll go quick about this one as we're almost out of time here in the sports hour. James Harden, 20 straight games with 30-plus points, and the Rockets' offense is basically just revolving around him at this point. Mark D'Antoni is completely changing his style of play just for... James Harden is for I don't know what specific reason that he wants to do that with James Harden. I don't know what specific reason that's going on there, but you know J- James Harden he's having some dynamic performances. He's had some 50-point games, 40-point games, 30-point games, but they're all over he's all over the place. He's getting di- he's such a great offensive player. He's a great shooter. I believe most of his points that he scored, if not all, are unassisted. So he's doing things by himself. He's running this Rockets offense basically by himself. Mark D'Antoni is changing his entire game plan, his entire type of play, just for this offensive outburst James Harden is having. 
He said, shots have fallen. I'm playing like myself. And that's how things are going. Rockets are coming off a loss to the Philadelphia 76ers. But we'll see how that stays in Houston and if they can be a team to knock off the Warriors. But that's going to do it for Episode 2 of the Michael Sports Hour podcast. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Sports Hour. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more of these. Comment down below your thoughts on any questions I asked during the podcast that you guys might want to weigh in on. Some of my thought, some of your thoughts. Weigh in on topics in the sports podcast. On the sports podcast, anything that you thought happened, and anything you want to talk, and anything you want to me to talk about in episode three of the Sports Hour podcast. Make sure to leave those in the comment section down below. You guys had some a couple of great topics that I wanted to that I had some good thoughts on. Kyler Murray, I was going to talk about that anyway, but the great suggestion and the suggestion to talk about the Cowboys' 2019 future kind of had an idea what they could have done to make things better. But, you know, thank you for the suggestions, guys, and make sure to leave more for the next hour of the Sports Hour. But until next time, again, thank you for watching Episode 2 of the Michael Sports Hour podcast.